Thank you all for joining us this evening for Tufts Law Day on the Hill, balancing the scales of justice and criminal law. My name is Dara Lynn Freitag, and I'm a co-chair for this event. I'm a proud graduate of Tufts University's class of 2002, Suffolk University Law School's class of 2007, and Georgetown University Law Center class of 2008, where I received my Master of Laws in Taxation. I'm a practicing attorney at Tarlow Breed, Hart and Rogers in Boston, and my practice revolves around estate planning, tax planning, estate, probate, and trust administration. Although we were not initially planning to meet virtually this morning, we are very fortunate to have members of the Tufts community joining us from across the country. During our first hour, we'll have a panel discussion, which will be followed by two separate breakout rooms, which will last for about 10 to 15 minutes each. And our four panelists will join a separate breakout room, and there'll also be a fifth breakout room specifically for current undergraduate students and current law students. So please be sure to keep our breakout rooms in mind for any questions that may arise during the panel discussion. So my co-chair Chris Vaccaro and I will be moderating the event, and Chris will introduce himself and tell you a little bit about our Tufts Lawyers Association and related groups. Thank you, Daryl Lynn. My name is Chris Vaccaro. I'm a member of the class of 81 at Tufts University, and I'm also a member of the class of 84 at Boston College Law School. I am um, an attorney at Dalton and Feingold practicing real estate as a partner in the commercial real estate department there. And I'm also a proud member of the Tufts Lawyers Association. I would like to just mention a few things and a few of the resources that you have out there. And I'm grateful that you're all here and that you're participating in this virtually. I know that it'd be nice to all be in a room together, but it's nice to have all of you here today. And um, I do want to mention that Tufts has a very active pre-law society and members of the pre-law society uh, were extremely helpful to Daryl and I in putting this program together. And in particular, I want to thank Jessica Perillo, who's here with us today, as, as well as Jonathan Yu, who did yeoman work and participated in the meetings uh, with us members of the Tufts Lawyers Association to make this a successful event. I also want to take a moment just to quickly thank Daryl Lynn Freitag, who's with us today as a, as a co-moderator, and also Elty Skendash, who both did a great job of helping us get panelists for this. I think we got a ter terrific panel, and we owe it to them in large part that we have the panel that we have. I wanna thank the Tufts Lawyers Association president, Steve Feldman, who has been leading us through all of this. And in addition, has agreed to serve as a panel. And I think you'll find what he has to say as a former criminal prosecutor, and now as a criminal defense attorney to be fascinating. Uh, I wanna thank Tom Dunn. He's our immediate past president who spent weeks working with us to get us to where we are today. This does not happen without Tom's efforts. Uh, I also wanna make the students at Tufts aware uh, of the efforts of Dovi King. She's a pre-law advisor at the Tufts Career Center. If you look up her background, you'll be thoroughly impressed. This woman has done it all in the legal profession and the Career Center is lucky to have her as a resource and Tufts students are lucky to have her as a resource as well. So I, I believe she may be with us here today. Um, she may have to leave a little bit early, but please don't hesitate to look her up because she can really offer some valuable guidance to all of you. Uh, I wanna thank Liam Cronin, by the way. Liam is, a, I believe, a 2L at Boston University uh, who has been with us all the way on this and planning this event. He's a recent Tufts graduate and uh, his insights have been extremely helpful to us. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I wanna thank Amy McDonald, who has been with us all the way, has attended every meeting and has really put this together. She's put together an exciting program. Uh, and so, Enjoy. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of different views today uh, and just uh, be here to listen and to state your own questions, if you will. Uh, we have a uh, comments. You can, you can make your questions in the comments at the bottom and uh, with any luck, we'll be able to get to as many of your questions and comments as possible. And we also have breakout rooms afterwards, as Daryl Lynn mentioned, and we encourage you to go there after the, our presentation. I believe I've said enough now. I'm gonna turn this back to Daryl Lynn so we can really get started with the panelists that you're here to listen to. Thanks. That's great, thank you so much, Chris. And the moment we've all been waiting for, I'd like to um, introduce our esteemed panelists and have them introduce themselves to you. 
each of our panelists, um, it, I think it would be helpful for all of us to, to learn more about your journey, your path, and your choices in your career. So first, I'm going to begin with Judge Kenneth, Kenneth Desmond Jr. Uh, when we first met, you shared with our panel that you envisioned yourself becoming an orthopedic surgeon. So was that before or after you came to Tufts? Tell us more about your path. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of Tufts as well, uh, class of 1985, and uh, pleased to be here as a panelist uh, with my other fellow panelists. Um, so thank you. Um, going into Tufts, I thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I was an athlete in high school and had uh, one had aspirations of being a doctor, and I thought I might be able to combine those two interests and perhaps be some type of a professional sports team doctor or a college team doctor or something of that nature. Um, and so that, that was my, my mindset going into Tufts. And my first couple of years, uh, that was the track that I was on. Um, when I got to my junior year, however, I felt like I was really struggling in some of my sciences and wasn't getting the kind of grades that um, I had become accustomed to getting and was working uh, pretty hard uh, to get the grades I was getting. And I kept thinking, you know, there's gotta be something out there that uh, comes a little easier to me. Um, and so I started looking at other, other majors and I was very, always interested in politics and um, started uh, looking at pol uh, political science as a major. And so I actually changed my major uh, the second semester of my junior year, which um, I was discouraged to do that. A lot of people told me, don't, don't do that. Uh, you know, you're coming up on graduation and that's quite a bit to kind of chew in three semesters. Um, but I, I just, my quality of life wasn't all that I thought it should be at Tufts struggling the way I was. Um, and I was still playing sports and I, I, I confess I probably wasn't as focused on academics as I, as I probably should have been um, between sports and, and other social activities. So uh, I, did, I did indeed change to political science and was fortunate enough to graduate on time, but had no idea what to do with a political science degree. Uh, many of my friends who were graduating with a political science degree were going to law school but I had never really considered law school and didn't want to apply to law school just because that seemed like what everybody else was doing. So I went to work for a couple of years. I worked as a manager for New England Telephone and I was in a two year management training program there. And I felt a, a two year look at that would be good for me. And if I enjoyed it, I could stay on. And if I didn't, um, at least I'd have that program on my resume, which I thought would be a good thing. And I could consider what I might like to do next. Uh, well, after about a year of that, I realized, well, this isn't really for me either. And so at that point, I'm at a crossroads. I don't know, is it work that I'm not really liking or is it this particular job that I'm not really liking? And so I knew there was no way around working. Um, so uh, I started looking at other things that I might be interested in and thought about business school, given I was working as a manager at that time and uh, looked at some of the curriculum for business school and realized this is what I did not want to do. And then I looked, at political, I looked at law school and started looking at some of the courses that they offered. And I was really interested in that, and um, particularly torts, where there were no right or wrong answers. It was what would the reasonably minded person do in the same or similar circumstance and support your position. And I felt that that is something that I think I might enjoy. And so um, I applied to a couple of law schools. I'm originally from Massachusetts, but had moved around to uh, western part of Massachusetts and then New Jersey and Rhode Island. I graduated high school in Rhode Island and my family had relocated back to Massachusetts when I was a junior in college. So I applied to a couple local schools here in the area and was fortunate enough to get into Boston College and ended up going to Boston College Law School from 1987 till 1990. Uh, in my third year uh, at law school, I was still playing sports and had a, a sports injury where I hurt my knee, had to have some surgery, and I missed a lot of the on-campus recruitment that was going on. It was the first year that BC had on-campus recruitment, and I missed quite a bit of it because I was laid up with an injury. And so when I got back to campus, I was kind of a little bit behind and had to figure out now, how do I go out there and, 
and try to get a job. And I went and I met with career services and they told me to just brainstorm, write down on a list of a piece of paper. We didn't have computers and all that stuff so much then a little bit, but not too much. Uh, all the lawyers you know, any place that you've ever worked during your law school and go back and ask those folks if maybe they had a job or is there somebody, some, a, re a referral for me. And so that's what I did. And I ended up getting a job for uh, Boston City Law Department uh, in their Corporation Council office. And I enjoyed that. Um, when I spoke there, this was, this was actually my internship I had there. And I went back there and said, hey, I'm looking for a job. And they said, well, we're not hiring right now, but I think you'd make a great prosecutor. And so go over and see this district attorney of Suffolk County. And uh, this was Corporation Council advised me to tell them that I sent you over there and I think you'd be a great prosecutor. Well, I'll be honest at the time, I really wasn't sure what a prosecutor did. I just knew I needed to have a job so I could tell my mom I've got a job as a lawyer and I'm actually getting paid and can pay off some of these loans that I had. And so I went over the, to the DA's office and uh, they were kind enough to offer me a position there. And uh, it was really the best thing that could have happened for me um, because I really did enjoy the work. I enjoyed the litigation. I enjoyed the competitiveness of it. Um, I really took to the courtroom itself and, and really enjoyed it um, more than I could have ever imagined. Uh, and along the way, um, sometimes you know we don't see ourselves the way others see us. And so as I was doing some different things that, at, in the DA's office, folks would tell me, hey, you might want to consider being a judge sometime. And I'd say, oh, uh, you have no idea. Uh, I don't think a judge is really for me. And so, um, but they start to put that in your ear a little bit. And, and at some point, you know, if you hear it enough, you figure, well, you know, why not? Um, you know, what's the worst that can happen is that, you know, you don't get it. Well, I wasn't a judge to begin with. So um, there was really no fear. Uh, I left the DA's office after about seven years and I went and I became deputy chief counsel for one of the local sheriffs here in Massachusetts, in Middlesex County. Uh, there were 54 cities and towns in Middlesex County. It's the biggest county in Massachusetts. I was in charge of all the litigation. Um, and that was a great burning, burning spot for me because a sheriff's office is almost like running a small city. Um, you have a number of unions, you have a a medical department, you have offices on the tiers, um, you have a, a cafeteria. And so with all of that comes litigation, whether it's slip and fall or negotiating union contracts or civil rights disputes. Um, and so it was a really great place for me to really learn a lot about civil law. Um, it sounds in criminal, but it's really civil law. And I had been a, a criminal prosecutor and this was a good chance for me to learn a lot about the civil, the civil side of things. Um, and I stayed there from 1997 until 2005, um, when I was fortunate enough to get appointed to the Boston Municipal Court by our governor Mitt Romney at the time. Um, and I worked as a Boston Municipal Court judge from 2005 until 2012. Uh, I handled all types of matters from guns and drugs to simple OUIs to some summary process matters. Um, and then uh, again, um, still had that kind of, hey, maybe be a judge thing in the back of my mind. So I applied to become a judge. Uh, and the first time I applied, our governor was uh, Jane Swift. She was the acting governor. And I, I didn't get through. I thought I was going to get through. I got very far in the process. But at the end of the day, I, I wasn't fortunate enough to be selected. Um, but I was told that I had I quitted myself fairly well and to try again the next time an opportunity arose. And so that's what I did. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get appointed by Governor Romney to the Boston Municipal Court, where I worked from 2005 until, uh, I'm sorry, from 2005 until 2012. Uh, and then from there, um, I was fortunate enough to get appointed by Governor Patrick to the Superior Court in Massachusetts, where I worked from 2012 until 2016. And then from there, I was fortunate enough to get appointed to the Massachusetts Appeals Court by Governor Baker, uh, where I sit as an Associate Justice now. So it was kind of a circuitous route for me to get there. Law was really never in my plan, um, but that's just how life works sometimes. And so uh, keep an open mind, be receptive to uh, folks who you consider mentors and that you trust their judgment. Um, because like I say, sometimes we don't see ourselves the way others see us, 
Um, but if you're open to that stuff, you never know where you might end up. So, uh, absolutely. I'm, my course Thank took you. that route, and I was really pleased with it. Thank you. Judge Desmond, that's wonderful because there, we have a lot of students who are tuning in and, and thinking about their path. So we appreciate your kind of sharing, as you said, the, the path that it wasn't as, as uh, straight as you know some other paths are. So um, I'd love to hear from the other panelists. Uh, why don't we go to Professor Coughlin? Did you grow up wanting to be an attorney or practicing in the area of criminal law? I know you're um, a professor and we very much respect all the work that you've done. So tell us a little bit about your path. Yeah, so I'm a, a 1978 graduate of Tufts. And so I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm certainly the oldest person on the panel. Um, and it's an absolute joy to be here. And I encourage students in the room to feel free to reach out to me um, by email after the program at any time, if I can be helpful to you as you're thinking about your projects. So uh, no, I did not grow up thinking that I was going to be a lawyer. Um, I grew up, I was born uh, during a time when women were not admitted to law schools uh, that, that easily um, and, and so forth. You, you probably are aware of those dark days. And so my ideas about my future were constrained by um, the prohibitions on women entering certain professions and so forth. And then voila, all of that changed and here I am. Um, but I went to Tufts uh, determined to study English literature, thinking that I would get a PhD in English at some point. And um, again, this is similar to the judge's story. Uh, some, sometimes your mentors know you better than you know yourself. And my dearest and closest mentor at Tufts was John Filer, uh, an English professor who is still there, uh, who is, uh, someone who helped me learn how to read and write and all those great things. And he warned me, he said, I don't think you're going to enjoy uh, studying English uh, at the PhD level. Uh, the, th the theory at that time was very abstract, very remote. Um, uh, he thought from the kinds of things that I wanted to do, but nope, didn't listen to him. So I went to Columbia and joined the PhD program there. Uh, realized very quickly that John was right. I did not belong in an English PhD program. And then for reasons I'll spare you, um, but they included the idea that I needed a portable career. I was married, I met my husband at Columbia and he was gonna finish the PhD. So I thought, oh my gosh, I've gotta be able to, you know, have a career that I can travel with wherever he goes. So I decided to go to law school. And the one thing that I wanted to say to the students in the room is um, take with a grain of salt the folks who tell you how dreadful law school is. If you land in the right place, I went to NYU, I absolutely loved it. I just was head over heels from the beginning. I had no idea what I was doing. I wanted you to be clear about that. Um, so each of us on the panel uh, sat where you're all sitting thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know anything, I'm clueless, how is this all gonna work out? You'll be just fine if you continue to uh, practice the skills and talents that brought you here. Um, but in any event, I, I suddenly said to myself, oh, people teach this. So I, I, I uh, probably my first semester thought um, I was going to try to chart a path to become a law professor. And um, what did I do along the way? I finished law school. I did two federal court clerkships. I clerked for Judge John Newman on the Second Circuit. His chambers were in Hartford, Connecticut. And then I had the amazing good fortune to clerk on the United States Supreme Court for Justice Lewis Powell. Then did a brief period of time in private practice, which included some white collar defense work. Uh, trials were not really for me. I was much more of an appellate focused person. Um, and uh, that, that, that obviously was setting me up nicely for the academy. I joined the law faculty at Vanderbilt in 1991 and got tenure there, but ultimately came and became a, a tenured member of the UVA law school faculty. And that is where I continue to work. Um, my teaching interests are criminal law, criminal procedure. I focus heavily on 
sexual assault and rape uh, uh, cases and that the movement to reform uh, that law. In the criminal procedure realm, I teach criminal investigation, which focuses on the constitutional provisions that allegedly constrain the police. So I think a lot about structural racism in policing and the contemporary crisis that we're seeing in the criminal justice system because of the effects of structural racism. Um, I am the faculty uh, advisor for our program in law and public service. So I'm deeply involved with the students who pursue public service careers. And I just learned a month ago that a new project that I'm working on in collaboration with colleagues from other departments at UVA, um, we got a huge grant and we are focusing on the connections between law and everyday conceptions of justice to try to understand why formal legal process seems to be in a crisis mode as we look around the world. Um, I teach law and humanities subjects. Shout out again to John Filer and my abiding interest in law and literature. And so that's where I'm coming from. And I look forward to the conversation and to hearing your questions. That's Thank great. You, Thank you so Coughlin. much, Professor Coughlin. That's wonderful. And it's interesting. I don't know if you've noticed in the chat room, but we've got some um, individuals who are agreeing with your path comments, your, your mentor comments. You know, I think um, professors and, and mentors really do have an impact. Chris, feel free to jump right in. Thank you, Daryl. Lynn. So I guess we will now turn to uh, Stephen Feldman, who, as I said earlier, is, a, is the president of the Tufts Lawyers Association. And Steve comes from a, a great background because Steve has worked on both sides of this criminal justice project. He has been both a prosecutor and he is now a criminal defense, defense attorney, I believe, in New York City. Uh, and so I, Steve, why don't you tell us about your journey? Sure. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Daryl Lynn. And um, thank you, everybody, for, for the panelists as well on behalf of the TLA and, and for all the attendees for making this program happen. We're really very pleased to have everybody here participating. Um, I, I'm going to I, I want to make sure we get to the substance here today and really spend the time on that. So I'll try to be brief on my story. Uh, I um, went to Tufts thinking I was going to do political science or international relations, uh, found my way into philosophy as a writing a requirement because I got to argue and write and, and for, you know, as, as the things I could do, which were things I loved, um, left, finished Tufts and went into politics for a couple of years, um, spending two years in between uh, college and law school was very good for me, uh, got me in a different mindset, uh, went to Georgetown for law school where I was uh, lucky enough to do well and, and like, uh, and like Professor Coughlin ended up with a clerkship with a federal judge. Mine was with the chief judge for the district court here in Manhattan. That's what brought me to New York City, um, which I thought was for one year and, and has ended up being 25 years instead. Um, and uh, wanted to be a litigator at that point, went to a small litigation boutique for three and a half years with two former federal prosecutors among the partners there. Um, didn't get any trials and said I didn't want to grow up to be a litigator who never tried cases. Uh, so among, and, and also believed in public service, was lucky enough to land a, a job with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan, spent six and a half years there, uh, a big chunk of that in the Securities and Commodities Fraud Task Force, prosecuting um, securities fraud and accounting fraud and people in boiler rooms calling grandmothers and stealing their life savings. Uh, very, very proud of that work. Uh, and then switched sides in 2008 and have been doing criminal defense for the last 13 or so 15 years now uh, and, um, and, and have been spending uh, the last few years uh, devoting some time to the Criminal Justice Act panel here in the Southern District of New York where I represent indigent defendants who are being charged in criminal cases in Manhattan uh, and in White Plains in addition to the work I do uh, doing investigations for companies and representing individuals when they're in the in the crosshairs of the government cases. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Laura, let's hear about you. And then I think we should segue into some substantive discussions of criminal law and procedure, because I know we have some great topics to discuss there. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, so I came to Tufts to study international relations, um, and I, I did end up majoring that. I enjoyed it a lot, but I think I always had it in mind, even from when I was young, that I was going to be a lawyer, um, partly because my dad had wanted to go to law school, uh, but in order to be able to afford to go, he would have had to go at night and work during the day. And right around the time um, he was making that decision, um, my mom became pregnant with me and um, he didn't want to miss that time with me um, as a baby. So he was concerned if he was working during the day and in school at night, he wouldn't see me. So on, on some level that was placed on my shoulders to be the lawyer in the family. And fortunately um, I was well suited to it. Um, like Steve, I, I worked for a couple years in between Tufts and law school. And that was the common thinking at the time. And if students are interested, we can talk about that in the breakout room. But the idea was that you would strengthen your law school application um, if you worked for a couple of years. So I uh, took that advice. And um, I really followed the two um, strains of interest that I had. So I was always very interested in politics, um, gender equality, and racial justice in particular. Um, and, I, and then, um, not dissimilarly, um, I had an interest in, in the theater. And when I was at Tufts, I was president of Torn Ticket. Um, I was a founding member of the Tufts Black Theater Company and really enjoyed doing that also as a child. Um, so my first job right out of Tufts uh, was working um, in a Broadway theater for the producer. And um, I left that job before I hated theater and theater people. Um, there was something about doing it for a living that took the joy out of it for me. And, and I, I didn't want to lose my love for it. So um, I left that job after a year and went to work on a congressional race on Long Island, um, which was terrific fun. And we had a heartbreaking loss, um, but it kind of um, confirmed my interest in, um, in politics. Um, and then I led the local Democratic Party in Nassau County, uh, Long Island, immediately before law school. That was a time when there were very few Democrats. Um, now, um, and, and for a, a little bit of time, it has been controlled by Democrats. Um, and then I, I went from there to law school. I went to the University of Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago. Um, but one of the things that drew me to University of Chicago is um, I'm I have very progressive politics and it's a conservative law school and there was something appealing to me uh, about being able to mix it up intellectually. Um, I don't mind being a little bit of a gadfly. So, um, you know, I, I did get that experience there and I'm, I'm able to very quickly um, anticipate what arguments will be on the other side of mine because I understand a more conservative mindset. <clears throat> but, um, but honestly, there were times when it felt very isolating uh, to go to a school where, um, you know, politically I was a minority. So that's another thing maybe we can talk about um, in the chat if people like. So um, I, I all along had an interest in criminal law and um, uh, employment law. And in fact, my parents, you know, did that big COVID clean out of all the closets that many of us did. And uh, my mom sent me a bunch of um, school assignments from when I was in elementary school. And so many of them were focused on crime. I was really fascinated by crime stories. I don't even know where that came from. Um, so um, after I clerked um, in uh, the Southern District of New York, which is the Federal District Court in Manhattan. Um, and after that, I was a little bit at loose ends. Um, I knew I wanted to work in the area of civil rights. Um, I just didn't quite know what to do. Um, at that time, the um, private sector market was very strong for lawyers. So my law school placement office didn't really have a lot of support to offer to people who wanted to go into public interest. And I flagged that for law students when you're thinking about going to law school, if you know what your particular interest is, check out your um, career office and see whether um, they have experience placing people or supporting people who are exploring that interest. Um, so in any event, I, um, I had a, a most extraordinary co-clerk who is still one of my very best friends. And she said to me, okay, you are gonna mentally take your resume, push it to the side, and um, just off the top of your head, answer this question for me. Name something you love about the world or something you hate about the world. And I said, I hate homophobia. And she's like, okay, you're gonna go work on that. And I said, but like, I don't have experience doing that. She's like, uh, uh, uh. we're not talking about your resume. I'm talking about, what you want to do in the world. And one, do one thing a day, 
to get you toward that goal of working to end homophobia. So I call Lambda Legal Defense, uh, which some of you may know um, uh, does impact litigation uh, on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I called them up and said, I'd like to volunteer and I'll work for free. And they said, thank you, but no thank you. Um, we only work with lawyers who are associated with law firms. And that was really confounding to me because here I was offering my services and they said, um, well, see if the firm owns a case, then even if the lawyer moves on, we have that stability and firms have resources like paralegals and copy machines and things that you don't have. So very disappointed. Um, I consoled myself by saying, okay, I did my one thing for the day. And um, on my lunch break, I went across the street um, to uh, City Hall Park, it was right across from the courthouse. And there was a big demonstration going on um, because at the time, and this would kind of foreshadow another aspect of my career, um, there was a very big case in New York City involving um, the police who had uh, sexually assaulted um, uh, a Haitian New Yorker. Um, and um, this may ring bells for some of you if you were living in New York during that time. And um, this was a rally that the Haitian community had organized in support of the victim. And um, there were so many speakers who were getting up and talking. I, I um, uh, you know, stayed for as long as I could. Um, and then the, the person who was emceeing passed the mic to someone. I didn't catch who she was. And she started speaking. And she said to, um, to the crowd that what the NYPD was trying to do was cover up their racism, having assaulted a black immigrant with homophobia, because they tried to claim that the life-threatening injuries he sustained at their hands was actually the result of having sex with another man. And um, she, she was talking about intersectionality, really, uh, although she didn't use that word. And what she was saying really resonated with me and kind of brought together different things in my life that had been um, important to me. And so um, she finished speaking and, and I'm looking around and thinking, this crowd is not gonna go for this, right? Because the, the frame that the other speakers had brought to the conversation was, this is about uh, racism. This is about anti-immigrant sentiment in the NYPD. I didn't think they were gonna go for saying this is about um, homophobia, but the crowd went crazy for her and what she had to say. So afterwards, when she gave the mic back to the MC, he thanked her by name and by the name of the organization where she worked. So um, long story short, the next day, my one thing was to call that organization and um, offer to volunteer. It was the New York City Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project, which is the largest LGBTQ crime victims agency in the country, serves the five boroughs of New York City, still in existence. And when I went in to interview to be a volunteer, um, who should be the volunteer coordinator, but the woman who I saw speak at the rally. So um, I started volunteering there. Uh, this is another tip for students. If you can't get your foot in the door in the nonprofit world, um, straight out of the gate, one way to, to uh, get a toehold is to volunteer. Because what happened was uh, they had exactly one lawyer on staff and um, that person left. Everybody else there was a social worker or a peer counselor uh, or a community organizer. So they said, well, Laura's here and we know her and she's been doing a great job as a volunteer and they offered the job to me. Um, so I had uh, several really wonderful years there and the lessons I learned working with the non-lawyers, working with social workers, working with peer counselors, um, gave me lessons I've carried through with me my whole career. So I'd also encourage uh, students to create professional opportunities where you're collaborating with people who are not lawyers. Um, that's a beautiful thing. Um, from there, I, um, I really, um, I started to get frustrated being a crime victim advocate and having to beg prosecutors to uh, do things the way the community thought should be done or where the victim thought should be done. Um, and about half of our clients were survivors of intimate partner violence. We also work with survivors of rape and sexual assault, police misconduct, uh, hate crimes. Um, so from there, I applied to join the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn um, and was very happily accepted. Loretta Lynch was the U.S. Attorney at the time. Um, and um, I had an incredible experience there, very collegial, um, very inspiring, uh, working with people who 
who were so good at their job that, you know, if so-and-so was doing a cross-examination that day in court, you would drop whatever you're doing in your office and run to court to see them. Um, very inspiring work. Um, I left there when I had my first child um, and I was home for um, eight years with my, with my two daughters, much longer than I thought it would be, although it felt like those years flew by. And I, when I went to return uh, to work, um, um, I actually found that having um, a Tufts degree and having um, been coming from the University of Chicago, having a clerkship, those were some credentials that were very um, helpful to me in, um, in getting uh, my career uh, going again. Um, it, it was slow going, it took me about a year, but I think it would have been longer having been home for that length of time if I didn't have those credentials kind of undergirding me. Um, and so I ended up joining the Civilian Complaint Review Board, oh, which is an agency in New York City. One of the people I know. Um, that um, it's, uh, it's a civilian oversight agency that investigates allegations of uh, misconduct by NYPD officers. Um, and, and I really um, had an incredible opportunity there to continue my work um, advancing um, gender equality and racial justice. Most of my uh, clients um, were young men of color uh, whose, um, whose rights have been violated by the police. Um, that was the height of stop, question, and frisk in New York City. Um, so what we were seeing was an entire generation of uh, young men of color who were being um, unfairly criminalized. Um, so I set up the prosecution unit there. It was um, the first opportunity um, for the agency and in the United States for civilian prosecutors to try police officers at disciplinary trials at police headquarters. Um, and I was a, I was a, a one woman show and I had a, a paralegal who assisted me, an investigator slash paralegal who assisted me. Um, and by the time I left, we had a full blown unit um, with attorneys and investigators who bring these cases um, and some of the very high profile cases in recent memory um, have been brought by uh, members of that team. Um, so very proud of that work. Um, so once that was up and running, uh, and, I'll, and I'll wrap up, um, I, I was ready for something new. And um, I was recu recruited by the late Ken Thompson uh, to join him in the Brooklyn DA's office. Um, DA Thompson um, was uh, the first African-American DA in Brooklyn. Uh, he came in on a, a, a mission to reform um, the office and reduce racial inequality. Um, and he asked me to come and work in, in a new bureau he established, the Civil Rights Bureau, um, that really brought together uh, the two uh, main areas I had worked on previously. So hate crimes and police misconduct. Um, and I did that for about a year. And then he promoted me to run the human trafficking unit, um, another place where income inequality, racial justice, and gender inequality uh, intersected. Um, and um, that was incredibly rewarding work. I was also very demanding emotionally. Um, and so uh, feeling like I wanted to step back a little bit, uh, I took a job I thought would be more like, you know, nine to six and less stressful. And that was working in the governor's office. And uh, that did not come to pass because COVID hit um, after I'd been there a little more than a year. And uh, my team and I pivoted uh, to uh, work on the COVID response. So that was incredibly uh, intense, challenging and rewarding period where what I was doing wasn't necessarily or even often legal, um, but problem solving, being able to think quickly on my feet, um, th those qualities I was able to carry over into doing the COVID response work. Um, when the governor was accused of sexual harassment, I resigned uh, almost immediately um, and, and took a sabbatical. So I had some time off after leaving the governor's office uh, really to recover from what had been uh, an unprecedented year for me professionally as it was for all of us uh, personally. Um, and then I'm very happy to have landed where I am now, which is at Wigdor LLP. We are a plaintiff's law firm that specializes in employment discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual assault cases. Um, and I think for me, this is the first time I've worked in the private sector. I've always been intrigued by the role the private sector um, can play in advancing justice. And I think we've seen in the last couple of years that consumers, shareholders, 
um, are holding um, private sector to account and saying, do you stand for what I stand for? And if you don't, then I'm not gonna support you. We've also seen um, private sector entities really stepping in and bringing their weight to bear to affect change. And, and particularly what inspired me was the, the uh, MBA's decision uh, to pull uh, the All-Star game um, from North Carolina when the anti-transgender bill was introduced. And having started my career working with the transgender community, um, I was really blown away by how that one act um, changed the civic discourse about the transgender community. And partly it was because of the, the central role that sports play in American culture. Um, and, and, and partly because people didn't expect the NBA to take a position on that. Um, so that made other people sit up and say, wait, is this something I have to think about? Like I'm a telecom company or, you know, I do something else. Um, I, you know, do I have to act on this? Do I have to take a stand? Do I have to look at my internal policies? And um, I was really moved by that. And so I've been thinking for a while about making the trans transition to private sector. Um, so even though Laura, I'm going to wrap up quickly, I'm I did. Gonna so jump in. I um, apologize. Um, Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. Of course. So I want to be sensitive to, to the time we have. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions. I want to I understand everyone knows that these are heavy topics we're gonna to be talking about. So first and foremost, before we get into our panel discussion, I wanted to make a point to just mention, um, our panel wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the recent presidential nomination of the first black woman and first public defender to the Supreme Judicial Court, um, Judge Jackson. So more than one of our attendees felt the same when registering and asked how important is it to have a former public defender in the nation's highest court. So um, the next few questions we're gonna ask, I'd like you to try to limit it to just a minute or two, just to respond if you would. Um, so I will uh, ask you Judge Desmond, if you wanna comment on um, the credentials of Judge Jackson. Um, she's blue ribbon. Uh, I think, you know, she's Harvard undergrad. She's Harvard Law School. Uh, she clerked for a uh, Supreme Court justice. She clerked for uh, a federal court justice here in Massachusetts, Judge Patty Saris. Um, I think she was a leader back in high school, most likely to succeed when she was in high school. She was in the debate team uh, where she won. Um, so I think she's just really been a leader all along. Um, and so, I think it's a great nomination. I think it also sends a message to America uh, that uh, everybody can contribute um, and, and to have the first black woman being nominated, I, I think is monumental um, and, and folks should take note. Um, it's not because there weren't others before her who did the job, uh, they just didn't get the opportunity. And so um, I, think, I think this is a good time for uh, America and we should all stand proud. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think so. I just add one very quick. <laughs> I, I promise to be 60 seconds. I, I want to second what Judge Desmond says about her credentials. Um, she is absolutely first rate, spectacularly well qualified, you know, probably better than some of the folks that are up on the court in terms of her experience. I, I will not digress, but I think it can't be. Um, overemphasized how important it is to have diverse perspectives among the justices. I clerked for Lewis Powell, and when I was at the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall was also on the court. And I just want you all to think about the, the significance of those two people being on the bench at the same time. Thurgood Marshall, of course, as you know, uh, led the, the, the magnificent campaign that culminates in Brown v. Board uh, of education and, and you know, is, is one of the most important civil rights decisions in our history. Um, so Thurgood Marshall is on the court. Lewis Powell, of course, my boss, had been the uh, chair of the Richmond uh, Board of Education uh, at a time when Virginia was leading massive resistance to the orders in Brown. And so there's just absolutely no question whatsoever that it was really important to have Thurgood Marshall on the court, giving his perspectives on 
um, the, 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 the civil rights movement that he led. And again, I'm not gonna go on and on, but I know from talking to my boss, Lewis Powell, that it made a huge impact on his thinking about what kinds of experiences the court needed to keep in mind. So again, yep, it really matters to have someone with a public defense background and an array of interesting experiences to bring to enrich um, the rulings from that group. That's Thank great. You, Thank you. Steve, I had a question for you. I know um, you mentioned you practiced on both sides of criminal law as a federal prosecutor and as a defense attorney. What would you say is being done right and what's being done wrong? So, so from down in the trenches, right? So that's my, my place uh, um, as, as uh, having been a line prosecutor for six and a half years. And now, you know, so one case at a time of prosecuting people, and now one case at a time defending people or, or doing investigations. Look, I, I, I'm very proud of, of my work on both sides. The, the thing in terms of what's being done right, look, for, there's a lot of criticism that's right out there about our criminal justice system. But I mean, from the trenches, I've never seen an innocent person convicted, right? Uh, I, I, for the cases I've worked on, I can't speak for the, everybody else. Uh, but whether it's on the criminal, whether it's on the prosecution side or the defense side, um, we, we've we've had you know we've had cases where we've had to convince prosecutors to drop them. We've had con to convince the you know the prosecutors they got it wrong. Sometimes innocent people are arrested and get stuck in the system. Um, but I've never you know as a prosecutor, if I thought somebody was innocent, we we were not going to prosecute that case. I was never going to go forward with prosecuting a case of somebody who, who I thought was innocent. And as a defense attorney, if the person's innocent, I'm not going to walk them into a plea deal. I'm not going to take them to plead guilty. Uh, I, I can't do that. So, you know, on that kind of big picture, it, you know, I, I'm proud to say in the work I do in the federal system, it, it doesn't happen. Um, as a prosecutor, I was never pressured to bring cases or to, against certain people or ever drop cases against people because of their, their place in society or their, or their or, you know, their social standing. Uh, it was, the goal was, and it was the, one of the reasons the job was so great. The goal was every day go in there and do justice, what it, whatever that meant. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, being very proud of. And as a defense attorney, you know, again, that, that prosecutors are open to using their discretion and dropping cases. And so we've convinced them to drop, even where people were guilty, technically guilty of something, we've convinced them that, for example, let the, let the SEC charge somebody with insider trading and go after them for money, but don't use the criminal system to put that person in jail. Uh, or, or just, um, you know, leave the secretary who did something wrong uh, and is you know an indigent uh, defendant who I'm representing uh, on the CJA side, but but don't prosecute that person, even though she's technically guilty. Leave her alone, and we've convinced them to do that, and that happens. You know, on the other side, on the bad things, look, there's too many um, cases involving you know too many laws in the federal system involving mandatory minimums, where the judges have no discretion. Um, to, to, to do a sentence in some right way. So I have people who go from having never been convicted, never spending a day in jail in their lives to suddenly facing 10-year mandatory minimums or five-year mandatory minimums. So, you know, the idea is that you would ramp this up a little bit, give them a, you know, the first time somebody does something wrong, give them two years or three years, not five years or 10 years. And yet that's the way our system works because of the laws Congress has passed. Um, so, so the judges don't have the ability to, to, to tailor the sentences. What else do I see wrong in the CJA cases? I, I, I see in these indigent defendants, people who have had terrible heartbreaking stories. It's not surprising that, you know, when somebody has been not given an education, um, not, you know, lived on the street as a homeless person with their mother in cars and in shelters, uh, doesn't see for himself or herself a future, ends up in the criminal justice system. Are they guilty of the crime? Yeah, but they shouldn't, be, you know, this isn't the time, society shouldn't have waited to put resources into helping these people until they're now involved with, you know, robbing drug dealers or, or whatever is going on that's a violent crime or something. It's, it's far too late. And these people have stories that are just far too sad, far too heartbreaking. Uh, and, and our system uh, is failing uh, as a society as a whole, in, in that these people end up, um, you know, with these, you know, terrible experiences having to, to plead for mercy. Um, 
So th that that would be a, a, a the short version. There's a, there's a lot more I'd have to say on the topic. And that makes me think of something Judge Desmond said um, when we were speaking as a panel in preparation for this, that um, good people do bad things and there are other circumstances where awful people are choosing lives preying on others. Um, do you wanna jump in um, Judge Desmond and kind of talk about your experiences in the courtroom? Uh, sure, I mean, <clears throat> I wish I could say that I, uh, I don't know any innocent people who've been prosecuted. Um, I think that happens. Um, but I guess the point is that, you know, I don't, I don't think many of us want to be judged necessarily solely on the worst thing that we may have ever done. And sometimes, you know, good people uh, make bad choices. They make mistakes. Um, and, and certainly they have to be held accountable. Um, but not every bad choice needs to be a life sentence. And um, sometimes people learn from their mistakes and go on and do great things. Uh, some people are just driven to be criminals. That's just the way they are wired. And so I, I fully understand that there are a lot of bad people out there who do bad things also, and certainly need to be prosecuted to the, to the fullest extent. Um, but, but not everybody. Um, who makes a bad choice is necessarily a bad person. And, and I think that's the role of the prosecutor, to be able to kind of see through who is it that I'm dealing with here and, and to temper justice in a way that fits this particular crime rather than a one size fits all. Thank you, Judge Desmond. Mike, I have a question for, uh, Professor, for Professor Coughlin, and that is uh, during our preparations for this panel discussion, uh, you had mentioned that sometimes it's difficult the way our system is structured with its problems, its biases, uh, the structural racism that we do know exists out there. If we do any reading, it's, it's there, it's, it's obvious. Uh, you said that sometimes you feel like this, the, the, the terms criminal and justice and the term justice just don't go together well when we talk about a criminal justice system. And I'd like you to sort of elaborate on that for our group. So thanks, Chris, for that question. It follows beautifully on the exchange that Steve and Judge Desmond just had. Um, I, I guess I, I like both of the, uh, both Steve and the judge, would, I'm deeply concerned about the question of innocent people um, being uh, falsely convicted. We have an innocence project here at UVA, which does just magnificent work. It's backbreaking, exacting work to go back over cases where people who were falsely convicted you know, need relief and it's very hard to do. So that's important. But I'm also very concerned about the question of which guilty people end up in the system. And we need, I take it, more prosecutors and defenders like Steve who are working in the trenches case by case trying to do justice for each individual person. And that's really important. But the question of course is who is it who among us, who, who of the guilty people end up in the system? Why is it that African-American children are prosecuted uh, far more frequently than white children? Um, and again, the data are just overwhelmingly clear that the system responds to crime by African-American folks or polices African-American folks in ways that white folks are spared. Um, so drug use is pretty, you know, constant sort of across all groups and across all races, but we have the impression that African Americans use drugs more than white folks do. That is a, a, a truth uh, that is created by a justice system that focuses on drug use by black people and not on drug use by white people. And so it, the, the, the structural racism is, is terrifying. Now, of course, there is conscious racism too. I wanna to be clear about that. Um, I am a survivor of the Unite the Right rally here in Charlottesville, and we saw plenty of white supremacy, um, including from uh, uh, law enforcement officials. So there's plenty of conscious racism, but the real problem I think right now is the so-called structural racism, which has led us to this place where we perceive 
African American folks, people of color, to be dangerous, to be criminal in ways that we don't perceive white folks to be. So you probably have been reading in the paper, the New York Times, for example, just published a story. It's been um, on the wires uh, in, in other places that the director of Black Panther, um, an African-American man, you know, Black Panther, that unbelievably successful action flick. So his name is Ryan Coogler. He's making a, a withdrawal from his bank branch in Atlanta. Um, he's again, African-American withdrawing some cash and, you know, folks think he looks like a bank robber. And the next thing you know, he's being handcuffed. Fortunately, in that case, the, the misimpression was cleared up very, very quickly. Um, but this, this happens all the time. And, you know, so, so, so these are the problems that I'm working on with my students, both in the classroom and in my new lab, is to try to get much richer perspectives about um, who is violent, uh, what justice looks like, and it's again why I really celebrate the the appointment of Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court because she will bring, you know, a wealth of experience and knowledge that the court badly needs. But structural racism is, I think, the one of the most important problems in contemporary criminal law. And that's why I say it is hard to put the words criminal and justice together when you have a system that uh, is producing results that are so devastating for African-American communities when white folks are doing crime to the same extent. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. That makes me think about Laura. Um, you had commented on your work with the late Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson and the work that you did to reduce uh, racial in inequalities. And you mentioned that you received pushback. Can you kind of talk a little bit more about that work and, and what you've seen? Sure. So um, I think what we had talked about in our call to prepare for this was that um, I served on the transition team for the new Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg. Um, who is a former federal and state prosecutor. Um, and he came in um, similarly minded. Um, he's also uh, the first African-American DA uh, in Manhattan. So there are a lot of parallels um, between um, what he is trying to accomplish and what uh, the late DA Thompson uh, was trying to accomplish, but it's been received very differently. Um, D.A. Thompson, um, uh, you know, was really um, able to make some reforms um, for which pushback is now um, being experienced by, by D.A. Bragg. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that D.A. Thompson led with establishing a conviction review unit um, whose mission was to ensure the integrity of convictions uh, past convictions by the DA's office. Um, and, you know, that's, um, you know, at, at that moment in time, there was a lot of focus as there appropriately continues to be uh, on people who were wrongly convicted. Um, you know, going back to what Professor Coughlin was talking about. Um, and, and really, really in short order, because he, was, he, he wasn't even able to serve out his first term before he passed away. Uh, there were, uh, many people, it's now in the dozens, <clears throat> who were convicted in Brooklyn, very serious crimes, who had spent uh, some of them decades in jail, uh, who were released because of the work of that unit. Um, and, um, and then when he wanted to make more sweeping changes, um, he started to lay the groundwork. And then after his passing, when DA Gonzalez took over, he spent a lot of time getting buy-in getting buy-in from community organizations, getting buy-in from uh, the defense bar, from prosecutors, from service providers. Um, there were uh, small group meetings that took place where the ideas he wanted to roll out were tested. Um, a white paper was prepared that was released publicly. 
um, you know, uh, and, and then there were a lot of internal conversations in the DA's office because culturally um, prosecutors are, uh, think about, um, you know, uh, prison time is the default, right? And what we were trying to achieve in Brooklyn was having that um, not be the default position. Um, same with regard to, to bail, that it was presumed you would always ask for bail. Um, and uh, DA Gonzalez building on DA Thompson's legacy was trying to say the presumption should be we don't ask for bail. And culturally, that was very hard to shift among longtime prosecutors in the office. I think what's happening in Manhattan is that DA Bragg came in and right out of the gate started to make big changes, uh, you know, like the ones I was discussing. Um, and I think, uh, and I don't know, but I would imagine I'm thinking that, you know, uh, a great deal of time has passed since DA Thompson um, was leading those reforms and that we've moved as a city in terms of thinking about what does justice look like? How do we balance um, uh, public safety and, uh, and, and, and justice for people who are caught up in the system? Um, and I think by coming out quickly and very boldly, uh, that generated a, a lot of pushback, not just perhaps internally at the DA's office, but, um, but uh, externally. Um, another difference is he's doing it at a time um, when crime is on the rise in New York City. Um, so that's a very challenging environment in which to, in which to uh, implement reforms that disfavor uh, bail and jail time. Um, but in my experience, and this was something a mentor told me that I've always carried with me, that whenever there are great strides forward, one can expect there's going to be pushback. It's just part of trying to uh, advance justice. When there is something really big that happens um, to move things forward, you're gonna get that pushback. So in some way, it's not unanticipated coming off all of the discussions um, after the murder of George Floyd about what is the role of police and what is the role of prosecutors um, that um, you know folks who aren't on board uh, with with reform with focusing on racial inequalities um, you know uh, may push back so I hope that answers your question Darren. Absolutely. Thanks for touching upon that. And I think, you know, we've talked about the fact that, um, and Judge Desmond in particular, that we, you know, there, there is a significant importance of having diversity in all phases of criminal law, police officers, defenders, jurors, prosecutors, defense attorneys. Um, I think, you know, we have about 10 minutes until we start out our, our breakout session. So I'd like each of you to kind of comment on diversity in the system. I know we've talked uh, separately about prosecutorial um, discretion and kind of uh, prosecutors putting their thumb on the scale and everyone's coming into this with bias. So I'd appreciate it if you'd all kind of jump in, weigh in, comment on these factors, but also, you know, what can we do? I don't want to end the panel by saying, you know, everybody kind of walking away feeling like, you know, we can't do anything about this. I want to think about, you know, what can we do if we're in the law or not? What can we do to make things better? So, Judge Desmond, would you like to um, to start us off? Oh, uh, sure. Um, you know, in kind of a global view, I, I think that anything we can do that makes somebody else's life a little bit better, then, then that's time well spent. Um, that, that's, that's a day well lived. And, and there's a lot of folks out there who don't have the voice that we may enjoy and through no fault of their own. Um, but I think it's important to be cognizant of that and to speak up when you see injustice. If you see something, say something. Um, sometimes it's the majority voice that really makes the difference. 
um, sometimes it's the, it's the voice um, from the black or brown person that really gets dismissed and kind of pushed to the side. Um, and it's not until uh, somebody from the majority says the same thing um, that people take note. And so we see this a lot, whether it's, um, you know, uh, crack addiction or an opioid epidemic. Um, now that it's hitting some of the bedroom communities, everybody wants to take notice about how bad drugs are. When it was just in the projects, when it was just affecting black and brown and poor people, um, you know, it was those drug addicts over there. Uh, now that it's affecting some of these college kids, kids at Tufts, kids at Harvard, kids uh, across the, uh, the country, um, well, now it's an opioid epidemic and everybody needs to get involved and we change the name of it and it's a whole different thing. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think it's important to, if you see something, say something. You know, I was taught as a young person um, that when, you know, people are telling off color jokes in my presence, whether it's about Jews or Italians or gays, to speak up, don't laugh at those jokes. Those jokes aren't funny because when I'm not there, it's the nigger joke. And, and so it, it's not funny when it's the black joke and it's not funny when it's the gay joke. And discrimination is discrimination. And so, however, you might find a way to kind of get involved in that stuff and speak up. I think that's, that's what we need. And whether it's somebody who focuses on appellate work or somebody who likes to be a litigator, we need it at all um, phases. And so wherever you, your passions lie, figure out a way to make a difference in somebody else's life. Um, I think you can't go wrong. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Professor Coughlin, is there anything you'd like to add along these lines? Yeah, I, I, I think the judge really captured the heart of, of um, the, the kind of advice that I would give. Um, one thing that's clear, again, these are heavy topics and we're grateful to you for coming along and thinking about them with us. They're, they're, they're really heavy, um, but they are our problems. They're all of our problems. And I think we need good people, as the judge said, working in all different spaces, police, prosecutors, judges, defense lawyers, juries, community activists, all kinds of folks um, um, coming together and working in different spaces to, to, to make a difference. Um, I guess for me, one of the things that I found myself reflecting on is that I'm often asked you know, how can you continue to do research and to work on these really difficult questions year after year? And of course, you know, I have to think about the people in the trenches who are actually working with um, the survivors of crime, their families, or folks who are unjustly accused or are being treated very punitively when others are not. So it's, it's really tough. There's a lot of suffering out there. Um, but this is good work. I mean, you really can do something to help alleviate the pain of folks around you. And the other thing that I've also found, I've been teaching for a very long time, I've talked to student, many, many, many students and people, is that frequently when we look at our own families, I mean, or perhaps ourselves, we ourselves have been the survivor of sexual assault. We ourselves have been the target of um, police abuse or police violence. Um, so, and let me also be clear, some of us have committed crimes. Like I'm, I, I won't tell you where my mind is going now, but, but it's very common for me to have conversations with folks, uh, including my own family members about um, their concerns about their, what, what I would call a rap sheet if I was trying to be cool. Um, so, so I really think this, this notion that these are other people's problems is, is false and that we should start recognizing that these are common human problems. And um, I believe that these are the kinds of problems that are incredibly engaging. And when all of you go to law school, you'll be forced to ask yourself, what kind of problems in the world do I want to work on? And there are a lot of different problems out there that you can can tackle. Um, Darlin was mentioning tax and estate planning. Um, there's just a huge array of practice areas that you can go into. Um, but give this one some thought because it's very rewarding work. It's very important work too. Um, 
Laura, Steve, would you like to add anything? So thanks, Laura. So I, I, I would echo what what um, Professor Coughlin just said about good people working in, in all different spaces. Um, you know, it, it, I, I've heard from people over the years, right? You, you know, people who are you know like me, kind of a, a liberal background, a tough, those kind of that. You know, why would you be a prosecutor? Um, you, you know, it's, is it right to be putting people in jail? Is it right to, and you know what, you could leave that job to the Cowboys, right? To the people who think that it's all about winning and think it's about getting the highest number uh, of putting somebody behind bars, but you can't, we can't leave those important jobs to those people. You need people who are going to, you know, maybe cry when they have a bad, you know, the law is the law and somebody gets sentenced who's guilty, um, but yeah. You know, it, it, it's what the, you know, you, you feel for it. And if you can get that case dismissed and figure out ways to help those people in the system in, in, in some other way, um, that's super important. And so I urge people to, to think about taking on important service in different ways. At the same time, um, I, I'm no doubt convinced that I would have been a better prosecutor had I been a defense attorney first. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot to learn from being on both, all sides of things. And so I, I urge all of you to, to figure out how to be, play different roles um, and, and play on different sides because the, the, the system does need you. So one of the things we've talked about when we were preparing for the panel today uh, that was really interesting was this idea of, is it better to advocate for change from within a system or from uh, outside the system? And I think the answer is yes. Um, and and you, can, you can do those things at different points in your career. Um, you know, so as a, as a prosecutor, um, I have a lot of discretion uh, in terms of how I am approaching things like sentencing and bail, um, alternatives to incarceration, even where I choose to direct um, uh, my investigations, um, but I needed people on the outside to, uh, to educate me about what the defense bar was saying. Um, you know, uh, one example that I gave to our group was really, um, I think in the last, you know, handful of years, we've kind of had the veil pulled back in terms of how cash bail uh, can serve to criminalize poverty. And I think in the day-to-day -day life of prosecutors, uh, they didn't think about that, right? It was like, this is what you do. You go to court, you ask for bail, and then it's about how much bail and what the bail package is going to look like, but not the institution of bail. Um, and so you needed uh, folks on the outside to ring that bell, and then you need folks on the inside to say, wow, that's really problematic. What does that say about who, who ends up being in jail and who's out and um, how does that uh, advantage or disadvantage your ability to prepare to defend yourself? You know, to Steve, Steve can tell you it's, it's very hard when you have a client in jail, much harder when you have an incarcerated client to prepare your defense. Um, so um, I, I, the answer is wherever you find an opportunity to make change, you can do, you can, you can do that. Something I want to follow up on what Mr. Coughlin said is this idea that sometimes we look to make change, we're looking at the end of the story. So for example, with human trafficking, when I would go out and talk to the public, people would say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I would never want a person to be uh, you know, compelled uh, into prostitution or compelled into labor. Um, well, what can I do? Like, I don't, I don't know anyone who that's happening to. Um, and my answer was always, well, if you care about uh, stopping human trafficking, then try and make change in the foster care system. You know, that, that is um, uh, a hunting ground for traffickers. Uh, they look for vulnerable young people. Um, if you really care about um, human trafficking, then you should be concerned about our immigration policies because many of those policies make immigrants vulnerable to trafficking. So kind of start further back in the story and look for the inequality there and um, do work that ends up being preventative Right, nothing would make a human trafficking prosecutor happier than to be, uh, you know, not have a job because someone has taken care of those structural inequality 
uh, pieces uh, so that people aren't being exploited. So I would say what, whatever you're interested in and your passion is, you can find a way to harness that uh, to affect change. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank, thanks to all of you. Now, obviously we went beyond the hour that we talked about, but uh, I believe we still, do still have some time for a breakout sessions. So um, Amy, do you want to relocate all of us into the certain rooms we're supposed to be in? Is it by yeah. magic? I, I will do that for everyone. I just want to first thank everyone, the panel and both Daryl and Chris for um, organizing this, for everyone hanging in there. I know there are other things going on in the world. I know a lot of the students and alumni here have other commitments, so I appreciate that. I'm going to stop the recording.